so we've done an episode on Room 40, and one of the two Patreon choices for Wednesday specials this month was the Enigma Code and how it was broken. So if you like cryptography and cryptoanalysis, well, you've come to the right place this week. Um, if you don't, sorry, uh, but that's what they asked for, so that's what they're going to get. So before we get into how to break Enigma, it's probably a good idea to know what Enigma is in the first place. And the first person who just says, oh, Enigma's a German code baking machine. Oh, I wish I could reach through the internet. No, I'm going to tell you somewhat how it works. Um, it is obviously an incredibly complex subject, um, of which people have written multiple books just explaining how the machine works, followed by lots of compli complicated mathematics that show how you can break it and why it was so difficult to break. But let's try and get this in a relatively condensed and understandable format. At its heart, the Enigma machine was supposed to produce what's called a polyalphabetic substitution cipher for the messages that you plug into it. That sounds very complicated, and indeed the way it did it was very complicated, but in very simple terms, this takes a message, and it can be whatever message obviously, and by application of a cipher key or code or what have you, you end up with a message that you can then transmit that looks nothing like the original message. And the phrase polyalphabetic substitution might give you an idea that this is basically substituting letters of the alphabet for other letters that were in your text to give what appears to be a bunch of nonsensical gibberish. So this is different from a code book such as was used in most of the German activities in World War I, which we discussed in the Room 40 video, where various orders and phrases were signified by batches of letters and occasionally numbers, and it's also slightly different to some modern cryptography methods which try to hide transmissions or turn them into something that is not identifiable immediately as characters. So trying to hide it in background radiation or as static or something like that. Now instead, the Enigma machine would produce a message that you could transmit in the clear and that anyone with the appropriate radio antenna could receive it's just that when you received it, it didn't mean anything. So how does this work? Let's look at a basic example. So let's take a basic word like hello. Now, obviously, there are 26 letters in the alphabet, so we can convert each of those letters into a number corresponding to its place in the alphabet. So we get 8, 5, 12, 12, and 15. Now we can add a number to each of those. Let's say we add 5, so we get 13, 10, 17, 17, and 20. And we can look up what those letters are in uh, the, those what letters those numbers are referred to, and we get M J Q Q T. So we can now transmit M J Q Q T, which means nothing on the face of it. But if somebody else knows that we are transmitting with a plus five um, substitution, then they can just take away. Do take away five if once they've converted MJQQT back into numbers, and they will get the numbers that correspond to hello out of it. That's all very simple. And obviously, this, including the numbers, there's just an easy way of referencing how it's done. You can just, just substitute straight away. Now, that's fine on the surface, but it's very easy to crack this code. Apart from anything else, there are certain letters that turn up very frequently in various languages, and so if the message has any kind of significant extent, then simply looking at the number of uh, the different letters and see which ones recur the most gives you an idea of what letter that most likely corresponds to. In English, for example, the letter E is very popular, so if you're reading a long message and you're using a plus five cipher, and somebody sees, oh, the letter J is recurring an awful lot, that'll probably clue them in that that is therefore the letter E, and from there it's very easy to break the rest of the code, because you can work out what's the relationship between J and E. Oh, right, J is five letters further down the line than E. What happens if I reverse all the other letters by five steps? Oh, right, I have a clear message. Great, fantastic. Pretty easy to crack. And at the end of the day, you can do this with any of these single step substitutions because, well, you've got 25 other letters in the alphabet, 
and it doesn't take very long to run all 25 possible permutations. Now you can make this more difficult by adding some kind of mathematical transform to your initial encryption key. In the first case it was a plus 5, but we could do something a bit more complex like say take the letter that corresponds to the number and then add say 0.75 of that number to itself and see what we get there. So again using our hello function 8, 5, 12, 12, 15 becomes 14, 8.75 so we'd round up or round down 21, 21, and 26.25, which then correspond, once you've rounded to the fractions, to NHUUZ. Now, in that case, the difference between the various numbers is different in each case. So H has a difference of 6, E has a difference of 4, L has a difference of 9, and obviously it's L again, same difference, and O has the, a difference of 11. So this is going to be harder to spot because it's not the same reference all the time, but as you guessed from L being UU, um, you end up with the same, num the same letter corresponding to the same letter just via a different method. So in this case, if you see an H recurring in a long message, you know the H will co probably correspond to E, which is a it's one of many clues, many ways of breaking uh, a substitution code like this. And then you can work from there. Now, you might not be able to immediately figure it out, but someone with a fairly sharp brain can work out a fairly simple mathematical interference pattern like that. But the common factor in both of these has been that we're simply increasing in this particular case, or you could decrease the numerical equivalent of the letters by a certain amount so they're all going in one direction the numbers are all either going to be higher obviously you can look back on yourself um, for higher letter values like x y and z um, and vice versa going down but everything's going in the same direction you're not going to have um, h corresponding to a letter that's further down the alphabet and e corresponding to a letter that's further back on the alphabet it's always going to be a steady progression. As we said, you might loop back on yourself, but that is in fact still progression. Now, where you can start throwing things into the mix, making things a bit more interesting, is by doing substitution that is not linear in that manner. So you could substitute, say, D for P, but you could substitute R for J. Um, obviously, uh, P is further down the alphabet, but J is further up the alphabet relative to your starting letters. Now that will confuse things a little bit more, but again, there's only so many combinations of the 26 letters of the alphabet that you can do. So cracking the code for a good mathematician who's used to this, especially with the, the clues that we mentioned before, is a relatively simple matter. Um, certainly something that could be solved in military terms a lot faster than the information will become out of date. So to make things more complicated and thus harder to decipher, we can move on to probability. Now probability is the, well, the chance of anything happening. Um, so let's say you flip a coin heads or tails, well, assuming it doesn't land on its side, you have a one in two chance of getting a head or a tail. But if you flip a coin twice in a row and you want to predict what that uh, set of results is going to be. Obviously you can have heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, or tails, tails. So you've gone from having two to four. And you might think, oh, does that mean it's doubled? Well, no, because it's actually an exponential increase. So you've gone from two to four, but if you add in another layer of coin flips, you now get eight. But this isn't a case of the odds just doubling every time you go one step down. It's a matter of squares, cubes, etc. This is denoted by the notation to the power of, which is the small superscript number. So in the case of a single coin flip, it's 2 to the 1, which is 2. In the case of two coin flips in a row, it's 2 to the 2, or 2 squared, which is 4. Then 2 cubed, or 2 to the 3, which is 8. Then 2 to the 4, which is 16, because it's 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, and so on and so on. Now, if you take something that's got more than two possibilities so let's say you are rolling a normal six-sided dice well obviously rolling a dice once you have 
a 1 in 6 chance, but if you roll the dice twice, you've actually now got 36 possible combinations, because it's 6 times 6, and the numbers go up from there. So if you have 26 possible combinations, because you have 26 letters in the alphabet, if you were to run your cipher through one set of substitutions, and then run your number, your cipher through another set of substitutions. So you, let's say we take our transformations that we had before, and we say, run the word hello through the first one, which was the plus five, and then we run that result, the M J Q Q T through the second one, which was the multiply by 0.75 and add it to itself. Then we end up with V Q C C I as an output. Now that's going to be much harder to deconstruct because you've got to, there's no direct relation between VQCCI and uh, hello, you've got to deconstruct two separate layers of coding, you've got to figure out what those are, you've, so you've got to take it, take off the uh, 0.75 multiplied by itself, and you've got to take off the plus 5, and obviously the 0.75 um, plus itself is relating to the 13, 10, 17, 17, 20 result that we got for the plus 5, which is nothing to do with the 8, 5, 12, 12, 15, although there is a relationship there. Now, that also probably sounds very complicated, doesn't it? And this is the problem. If you, if you do two, oh, two sets of substitutions, um, then you have 26 squared, or 26 times 26 possibilities. So assuming you've got a constant factor, which in this case we do have, there's 676 possibilities. Okay, well now let's try transforming it through a third time. Well, now we've got 17,576 possibilities, and well, you're thinking, now that's going to be a little bit harder to crack, isn't it? If you've got 17,576 possible combinations to try, that's going to take a while, especially in an era critically early before computers, where you have to do this all by hand. So how does this all relate to Enigma? Well, Enigma worked by taking a series of rotors as its base point. So each rotor had the 26 letters of the alphabet on it, and the first rotor would be wired up such that when you pressed a button, let's say A, it would go through this rotor, which uh, had a wiring from one plate on one side to one plate on the other, because the letter A would generate an electrical signal, but that would be wired up to a point on the other side of the rotor that corresponded to a different letter. So let's say A would transform into M. But this wiring sequence was not sequential, it was randomised. So as we said before, A could go to M, but B could go to A, and Z might go to Q, and all other sorts of wonderful loveliness like that. Great so far. And then there would be a second rotor. And so you'd take, let's say your A has gone through to M, and so it would enter the second rotor as M, and it would go through to the other side, and it would come out as a completely different letter, because the second rotor, which would be numbered, would be wired up completely differently. So whereas on the first rotor, M might go through to T, on the second rotor, M might go through to D. So your A has now become a D. And then the third rotor, wired up differently still, would do the same thing again. And then on the on certain Enigma machines, the three rotor machines, the signal would pass through what was called a reflector, and it would then enter back into the third rotor coming in from the other direction at a completely different point. So that's another transformation step. And then it would go back through the rotors, obviously because it's now entering the third rotor at a different stage, exit at a completely different stage, and so on. So it would actually go through seven transformation steps. So that means that when you're trying to work out what how many possibilities there are just using that, that's 26 to the seventh power. And 26 to the seventh power, for those of you who are really quick at maths, is 8,031,810,176 possible combinations. So this is getting into the realms where you can't humanly presume that any legitimately reasonable number of researchers is going to be able to try out all of those combinations in time to make that information that they might get out of it in any way useful, at least by sheer random brute force attack, which basically means you try each one, one after each possible combination, one after the other.
Except, of course, we're talking about the naval enigma specifically, although this will cover enigma as a whole, but the question was specifically about naval enigma. But anyway, naval enigma in the Kriegsmarine used four rotors, which means you're going through four sets of rotors going one way, then the reflector, and then four sets of rotors coming back the other way, which actually means nine transformations, which then translates to 5.429 to the twelfth power, which is trillion. So you're talking about 5.4 trillion possible combinations. But if you thought the numbers had stopped there, oh no, it gets even worse. That's because big numbers are big numbers, true, but mathematical equations can help solve that. Now remember we said at this point in the early part of the war there are no computers, true, but you don't have to try every single possible combination. You can try mathematical formulas that will give certain relationships, and that will help you to narrow down the options, which means that a reasonable sized team of humans can solve even such a complicated possible encryption method in maybe a few hours, maybe a few days, but certainly enough to make orders like prepare to move out in three days worth intercepting and decoding. But the Germans had thought about this, so there were two further innovations to the Enigma machine at, in its base form, just in, in the actual box. The first was the introduction of a stepper motor, and this took the form of, well, a small lever. So when you pressed the uh, first key, you'd end up with a letter, and that would be turned into another letter. But then the rotor, the first rotor, remember, that was setting up all these trillions of combinations would take a step around. So whilst you could relatively easily, for a given value of easy, mathematically solve one set of equations to derive a message, even something that's encoded in one of several trillion possibility, possible ways, by the time the operator hits the second key, because the rotor has taken a step around, you've got an entirely different set of possibilities. So if we take our example of hello, H will have been encoded one of several tri trillion possible ways, but then E will have been encoded in one of several trillion separate possible ways because we've just changed the sequence of the rotors. And bear in mind, because it goes backwards and forwards, that's passing through the different rotor twice. And obviously it's connecting to completely different letters because if our if we take go back to our previous example, if our A is going through to M, if M was previously going through to D, but now our rotor has stepped one, so M is actually going through to E, and E is going to be connected to a completely different letter than what D was connected to, and so our end result after just that first set of rotors is going to be completely different. And then just to add insult to injury, every so often, either one full rotation of the first dial, or possibly every half rotation of that dial, or one or half rotations of the dial subsequent, each other rotor would also change. So over the series of a message that involved more than 26 characters, you would end up with at more than one possibly more than two rotors stepping round, which means the number of possibilities just goes absolutely berserk. But it's still all linear and can be solved within reason by a lot of people with a lot of equation boards. But now you enter the plug board, for you see the plug board is a section at the front, and that's another completely random set of circumstances, because at least with the rotors, every single letter is being changed. But with the plug board, this intercepts the signal between the key and the rotors. And as you can see in this picture, only some of them are wired up. Typically it was 10, sometimes it would be 15, sometimes another value. But what this did, as you can see, is it transposes certain letters, but it doesn't transpose all of them. So even if you solve the trillions or quintillions of potential combinations that you'd get out of the rotors, you're still going to end up with a bunch of absolute nonsense because half the letters have been transposed to completely random other letters. And all of this assumes that the rotors are all starting at the same positions, because each rotor obviously corresponds to the 26 letters of the alphabet. They were all usefully labelled, as you can see, A through to Z. 
but they could always be different. You could have different combinations. So you have your first rotor, you could have your first rotor set so that you type in the letter A, and assuming it doesn't get switched by the plug board, the A might not enter into the A on the first rotor, it might enter onto L. And again, on the second rotor, it might not enter through the A socket there, it might enter through G, and then the next one it might enter through B and so on and so forth. Obviously three and four rotor variations. So all of this is dramatically increasing the number of possible combinations and the difficulty of the math involved and thus might take, making it take far longer to crack any given Enigma cipher. Added onto this is the fact that not only were the various machines using three or four rotors, in the naval case obviously the four, four rotors, but there were more rotors available than that. So for the Army Enigma units, they actually had a choice of five rotors, and for the Kriegsmarine units, they had a choice of eight rotors. And you could choose any three or any four of those rotors. For the, for the future, I'm just going to refer to the Kriegsmarine ones. So you've got four rotors and you've got eight choices. So now you can choose different rotor combinations as well. So you could say, right, well, today we're going to use rotors one through two, three, and four in that order. Tomorrow we're going to use four, two, three, and one. The day after that, we might use seven, five, two and three and so on and so forth so you're just making it exponentially harder at every step but enigma did have two serious built-in flaws one of which was that the various rotors were all fixed so all rotors marked one had exactly the same wiring all rotors marked two etc etc and this was necessary because obviously there were lots of different machines and you had to encode and decode on any given machine so if you could figure out what the rotor settings were for each rotor that massively reduced the number of uh, possibilities that were available to you and secondly was the fact that because of the way it was set up the enigma machine could never code a letter back to itself now, so that meant that basically if you typed the letter A, any number of letters might show up, but the one letter that would never show up when you typed A would be A. Now, you might think, well, surely that's a good thing because you might accidentally end up encoding the text exactly the same as it actually is. Well, no, because remember, it's changing every time you press the key, so you're always going to end up with a complete gobbledygook. But the reason this is important is because remember those numbers we were talking about, it actually massively reduces the number of combinations. Now, there's still a lot, but that reduction is quite important. So if we are looking at just going through the four rotors and back again, remember, which is to the nine transform. So 26 to the power nine, which is if, uh, if the machine was able to rotate it back to any letter, including itself, would give you just over five and a half trillion, just under five and a half trillion possibilities. But since it can't, there are only 25 possibilities and 25 to the nine is 3.8 trillion. Now you might think, well, that's not especially comforting, but it's knocked one and a half trillion possible combinations off, which is a significant amount. And obviously as complications get more and more, um, those that slight change in numbers at the beginning a reduces the number of possible combinations at the end by significant numbers when it comes to trying to solve these things but b it's a known weakness in cryptanalysis terms because you know one thing that it cannot be so there's a whole bunch of equations that can try to solve for a substitution cipher which will swap any letter for any other letter including itself but by having a fixed point that you know whatever letter you've got it cannot possibly be that letter in the final decipherment is actually incredibly helpful for um, decoding these things there's a lot of very heavy math behind it but I think we probably don't want to get into that I mean we're 25 minutes in and we haven't even gotten on to the historical part of it, we're still trying to explain how the machine works. Now, of course, the problem is, once you've got this wonderfully enciphered bit of text, you can transmit it in the clear and it'll just be a complete jumble of gibberish. How does the person at the other end know what's going on? 
Well, the thing is, because it's purely mechanical, with the same starting settings, any Enigma machine that's using the same set of rotors will be able to decode it perfectly. Because remember, the cipher is going through the rotors one way, then back through the rotors the other way. So it's, start, it's finishing up at the point that it started out. So if you take your gibberish text and you plug it into an Enigma machine that started off at the same settings that the machine that encoded it in the first place was set to, it will basically do a reverse loop through the entire machine and come out perfectly readable. This is a good thing. However, how do you know what the other guy's settings were? You can't very well transmit those settings in the clear, which is what you'd need to do, because obviously you can put them in cipher and the person doesn't know what the settings are, it's useless. But if you transmit, oh yeah, by the way, everyone, today we're using um, wheel 4, then wheel 2, then wheel 5, then wheel 1. Um, that's not going to help you with your encryption, because everyone else who's listening is going to go, oh, thank you very much. Right, now we know what to, <laughs> what we, what settings to use in our own machines if we have them. And uh, obviously you can capture the Enigma machines, or, as we'll come to in a minute, you can build your own. So what would happen is every Enigma machine would come with a code book and within this code book would be settings for every single day. So every single German Enigma operator on a given network, so obviously the army units, the Luftwaffe units, Kriegsmarine units, etc., they'd all have their own little networks. But anyway, so let's say you're in Norway and you're waiting to receive orders from Kriegsmarine High Command and it is... January the 5th, 1942. So you will open your little book and you will look for the heading January the 5th, 1942, and then you'll get your wheels out, your rotors, and you'll go, right, I need this wheel, this wheel, this wheel, right. Put all my four rotors or wheels in one after the other in the correct order. And I'll then look at the ring settings. So, I'll, okay, I need to turn this one to um, C, then I need to turn the next one to Y, then I need to, next, and so on and so forth. Then, it gets busy, doesn't it? Then you have to look at your plug board and you're right, okay, so today's settings, we're going to move E to Y, we're going to move I to Q, we're going to put K to U, and we're going to put B to X, and so on and so forth. Great, fantastic. You are now set up. Now, assuming that nobody knows what the wiring settings in your rotors are actually are, you have a machine that can configure a message in one of around 3 times 10 to the 114 possible combinations. Which, if you want to put it another way, is 100 decillion, that's decillion, times the number of protons in the observable universe. But if the enemy knows what the wire configurations on your rotors are, it comes down a fair bit to a mere 100 sextillion possible combinations, um, which is about 100 times the number of grains of sand on all the beaches of the world put together. Other numbers that share this lofty order of magnitude are the lower end of the estimate of the number of stars in the observable universe and the number of atoms in one mole of a substance for those chemistry and physics nuts around, otherwise known as Avogadro's constant. The Germans also tried to add further complication to the method by getting the rotor settings to be changed for each message. The way they do this is you'd have your Enigma machine set up to the daily setting, but then the person who was sending you the message would choose a four-letter word or string of letters, three letters obviously in the case of uh, an army unit, and they would encrypt this twice using the base settings. So they might choose, being the German, the word Eine, E-I-N-E. -E. So they'd type Eine, Eine, into their Enigma machine, and this would give them a eight-digit string of letters, and this would then be transmitted to the uh, receiving station, and the receiving station would put this string of letters into their settings, and that would give them Aina Aina. So they would then, both on both ends, change their rotor settings 
to this particular combination. So instead of whatever the daily setting on the rotor is, you now change it to this one that had been chosen purely for this message, purely by that station, adding a whole other layer of complexity to it. Or had they? You see, this was actually an operational flaw. We've already discussed the uh, built-in flaws to the Enigma machine, but what about the operational ones? And you might think, well, this is adding a whole level of complexity to it. Surely this is going to make it more secure. No, actually, because once someone on the other end of things that you don't want to be listening in on your messages has cottoned on to what you're doing with this opening statement, if they know that that encoding contains a repeated statement like Aina, Aina, um, then, or if you wanted to say 4-4 four, four in German, via, via, then they can look at the two blocks of four, or in the army case, two, three, two blocks of three, and they know that there is a distinct mathematical relationship between those two because it's the same thing. So, okay, so we know after four presses of the keys, let's say using Aina, Aina, that E has become this letter in the first type case, and it's become this letter in the fifth case. So four steps in, we can actually work out a mathematical relationship, and that can be the first step towards breaking the whole encryption. So why have we just spent about half an hour talking about high concept mathematics, cryptography, the interior of Enigma machines, the various settings, and a couple of sidetracks into related subjects? Simply put, to give some idea of just how colossal a task decoding this thing was. Bearing in mind that any decoding had to be done either by hand, or if you had some kind of system to work it out by, you had to build a mechanical machine that would do some of those calculations for you. But such a machine was useless unless you could work out how the Enigma machine was built in the first place, which meant you had to first crack at least one of these ridiculously complex messages by hand. Now, with all that in mind, I'd like to introduce you to Marianne Rajewski, who is quite possibly one of the most brilliant people I've ever read about, because he took one little bit of information, um, this was before the Kriegsmarine added the fourth rotor, um, which was that the first three letters of a message were the same as the second three, because that was the uh, change of rotor, signal, uh, rotor positions signal that we discussed earlier. And based purely on that, and those six character strings that were transmitted by various German stations, he managed, through sheer hard work, and I have no idea what his IQ was, to determine not only the cipher that those were sent in to decode them correctly from the mathematical equations that he derived from that cipher he managed to completely rebuild a three rotor enigma machine from scratch and just to re-emphasize that he used six letters and a ton of math to reconstruct the world's most complex cryptography device at that point, this being the early 1930s, purely through the power of his mind. If this man was not subsequently unable to walk at an even keel because of all the medals the Allied powers pinned to his chest, I want to know why. Nonetheless, having effectively rebuilt and reinvented the Enigma machine effectively from scratch, that still didn't help figure out what the individual settings were for each day. But a mind like this is not going to be held back by such a minor thing as not knowing what one of several million possible combinations were um, from the, to start with, so he invented the rather wonderfully named Cryptologic Bomb, which was unfortunately not some kind of radio transmitted explosive that detonated Enigma machines at a distance, wonderful as that may have been, Instead, this took the form of a number of replica Enigma machines all wired together and being tested repeatedly for different combinations of rotor and plug board settings to see if any of them would spit out something that resembled a readable text using the various transmitted uh, six-letter and obviously later um, eight-letter encryption keys. And then once you had that, you were 
pretty much on your way to set solving the actual cipher key for the day. To give you some idea about how efficient this was, by 1938 they could reconstruct any key that the Germans had for any given day in about two hours, which, unless you were transmitting a signal that basically read attack in the next half hour, meant that German transmissions were now basically not encrypted. Unfortunately, it was in 1938 that the Germans introduced rotors 4 and 5, because remember we said they had 3 in the army units, and initially it was just those 3, then they introduced 4 and 5, and the Kriegsmarine obviously had, now had 4, and we're introducing uh, another 8, and this increased the number of possible combinations to well beyond that which the Polish machines could counter in a reasonable time period. Due to the fact that the Poles had managed to work out what the internal wiring of each rotor was, they managed to produce these. This was the product of another Polish uh, cryptologist, Henrik Zagalski, and each of these sheets represented the known starting position of each rotor. And by superimposing various combinations of these one on top of the other, using the initial encryption key, you would eventually end up with only a single aperture showing as a possible valid combination, and this would tell you that you had successfully decoded that letter. And from that they could work out what the order of the rotors were, what the settings of each of those rotors were, etc, etc. And thus they could work out the entire cipher key. This worked for a couple of years until the Germans changed how they in encrypted those message keys in the first place, but it was good for a, a couple of years as we said. By the beginning of the war the British had made some headway into cracking certain parts of Enigma, but nowhere near as far as the Poles had. And credit where credit is due, it must be noted that the Poles' efforts had been helped greatly at the beginning of the 1930s by the fact that the French had managed to secure a number of documents related to Enigma, manuals on how to use it, pages of keys and such like, and this had helped greatly in reduce Key's initial mathematical constructs to solve the mysteries of the initial 1930s Enigma machines. On the Kriegsmarine side of things, the Germans were still also using encoded books like they had in World War I, so that meant even if you decoded the transmission, you'd still have blocks of text that didn't actually mean anything unless you had the code book to look up what those various code blocks meant. But the army communications were a bit easier to read. In the late 1930s, the Poles shared much of what they'd learned with the British and the French, who quite bluntly were completely astonished at the complexity of the efforts that they'd gone through and just how far they'd gotten. To give some idea of the level of difference, the Poles, as we said earlier, take a couple of hours to crack any random daily German transmission, whereas the next best effort on the British side was occasionally being able to read parts of a message if you happened to know Italian. The Germans were helping somewhat by being rather lazy with a number of their encryption keys, which was a feature you might remember from World War I as well. So when they were transmitting those initial changes in setting, well, it would be very difficult to think of, well, going by the Kriegsmarine standard, a four-letter word that's different all the time. So quite often you would have the uh, 1930s equivalent of having your password set as password or 1234, which would be the key to be being transmitted would just be AAAA or BBBB. And so if you encode B eight times to get your two sets of Bs, it becomes vastly easier to solve back what that encryption key is and therefore, or that encryption setting is, and therefore reverse engineer the rest of the settings. Whilst the Germans would stop transmitting this duplicate encoded cipher around 1940, thus making m many of the aforementioned methods much more difficult, if not impossible, to use, the German invasions did have one small benefit, which was that by invading Poland they forced the Polish cryptanalysis team to flee to France, and then by invading France they forced both the French and Polish cryptanalysis teams to flee to Britain, which now meant that you had British, French and Polish cryptanalysis teams all in the same location, all able to work on the same thing. <laughs> 
Despite the German changes to their security and settings, there was one major flaw in a lot of their messages, which, although it wasn't quite as egregious as the earlier flaws, and therefore took longer to solve for, did allow for a number of messages to still be broken. And that was simple human laziness. Basically, almost every message, although not all, began with the letters A, N, and X. And the reason for this was that each rotor had 26 settings corresponding to 26 letters on the alphabet, but this didn't leave any space for numbers, or punctuation, or spaces. And so the Germans had chosen to substitute the letter X for a space, and the letters AN, AN, are the German for TWO, and you can see how a great many military messages might read TWO, whoever the message is for, and this obviously in German translated to AN and then X for the space, so knowing that almost all the messages they received after they sent through the key settings would start with an enciphered version of ANX meant that deciphering was still possible, albeit slower and less frequently. There were other flaws that would allow the breaking of certain Enigma cipher keys on certain days, such as the fact that a message might be transmitted by Enigma, say from Berlin to Kriegsmarine Western HQ, but it might then be relayed out to something else, say a port or a U-boat or something like that, that didn't have an Enigma machine in a lower level cipher, which was much easier to break. If that message could be broken, and they knew from the radio transmissions that the message had gone from Berlin to Kriegsmarine Western HQ and then out to another destination, they knew that the text of the message was the same, and if they had a copy of that message, they could then have a starting point with which to break that particular Enigma cipher key for the day, which obviously would then allow you to read all the other messages that have been sent using that same key that particular day. There were numerous other operational flaws and mistakes that were made, but I won't go into all of them right now, although it must be noted that one particular new rotor wheel that was added was sold very quickly when some poor old German signalsman was turned, told to send a dummy message, and he just decided to send all L's, because he was bored, presumably. And this is where that factor of the, uh, the Enigma machine not being able to code back to the same key came back to bite them, because when they received the message, or intercepted the message, I should say, over at Bletchley Park, they noticed, well, hang on a minute, there's this massive bunch of text, and there's not a single letter L amongst them. Hang on a minute. And uh, very quickly, they were able to solve that encryption, which then allowed them to work out the wiring of that new rotor. And of course, with that mention, it's a good time to mention Bletchley Park. So Bletchley Park was a location in England where all the decoding was now taking place, with the exception of some uh, cryptanalysis team members who, for various reasons, usually having being that they'd operated in Vichy France for a while, so they weren't necessarily sure if they'd been compromised, were working elsewhere. At Bletchley Park, they began to work on new methods of solving the Enigma in ciphering, and one of these was an enhanced version of the Polish cryptologic bomb, as you can see here, and this was basically a series of multiple identical copies of the Enigma rotor wheels all running round together. And with this, they would take an educated guess as to a portion of the message using various commonly known items that were included in many messages, such as the aforementioned ANX, and this would then be compared by the machine with the cipher text that had been delivered to it. And since a number of the capabilities of Enigma were known, as we said, such as the fact it couldn't code back onto the same letter, these rotors could all work their way round until they found a combination of rotor settings that didn't produce text that contradicted these known capabilities, 
It didn't necessarily mean it was the right setting, but it meant it was a setting that may possibly work. So you could note that down and then off it would go again. So this would eliminate all the chaff settings, all the ones that were theoretically possible but wouldn't actually work with that particular text, thus vastly accelerating the process of decoding. Of course, while we're on the subject of great minds, it's worth mentioning that, of course, at Bletchley Park was Alan Turing, genius mathematician himself. This was where simply having more money and industry helped greatly, whereas the Polish cryptanalysis team had only been able to produce six machines to try and decode Enigma rotor settings. The British, using said industrial advantage, as well as obviously Polish and French, as well as their own expertise, were able to produce several hundred of these machines, which individually were larger than the Polish ones anyway, and these could be manned by a team of several hundred operators who would effectively use these known weaknesses in German transmission discipline to try and brute force the remaining possible rotor settings. Meanwhile, out on the front lines, various German codebooks were being recovered, and other Allied efforts were factoring in to the fight against Enigma-encoded transmissions, specifically the fact that the Allies had invented a way to track U-boats via their radio transmissions actually helped decipher Enigma messages, believe it or not. And the way this worked was that because the U-boats now knew that to transmit or receive significant amounts of information took a long time, and an aircraft with a radio direction finder would be very likely to lock onto them, come in and depth charge them, they were put under a system whereby their messages had to be very short but to be very short and to communicate large amounts of information, you had to use a set of stock code phrases, much the same way as how a naval signal flag can communicate a lot as long as you have a flag book that tells you what they mean. Of course, this meant that once a U-boat had been captured with its code book intact, you then had a limited set of phrases and code groups that the transmissions could actually be, which again reduced the complexity of what you had to solve for. Of course, not all signals used that particular codebook, but there was enough traffic floating back and forth using the codebook that this could be used to crack the Enigma cipher key for the day, which could then be used to crack all the other longer messages. Whilst also putting their prodigious talents to use in working out some of the starting points from which to try and decrypt a cipher key, Turing, the Poles and others were also working on inventing newer, larger and faster mechanical rotor comparison mechanisms, the successors to the Polish cryptologic bombs, which would help decipher the rotor settings faster still. Now, Bletchley Park is frequently known for inventing what's quite possibly the world's first computer, Colossus, but Colossus does not feature in the story of deciphering Enigma because that was developed to decipher an entirely different set of German transmissions, which used a completely different encryption device. In 1942, of course, America entered into the fight, and if Britain had money and industrial might well in excess of what Poland had been able to bring to bear on the problem. Adding the Americans into the situation only made things worse for the Germans and much better for the Allies. With a fresh pool of resources and brain power to draw on, Turing and the Polish inventors cooperated with some of the finest American minds to produce even faster, larger and more capable mechanical analysis devices, the bombs, the Germans were continuously suspicious of the Allies' success in rerouting convoys to avoid wolf packs and knowing what the sizes of the wolf packs of U-boats were, but many of the most suspicious events fortunately seemed to time in with other things. For example, in early 1942, there was a major upgrade to the signal security and level of complexity in German Kriegsmarine Enigma systems, and for a while, this massively reduced the output of Bletchley Park, also known as Ultra Intelligence. And obviously, more and more ships started to go down. Now, the Germans might have picked up on this coincidence, except for the fact that around the same time, they were ordered to attack targets off the American East Coast, which were easy targets for a number of other reasons. And so the overall increased effectiveness of the U-boats was masked by this particular campaign off the east coast, and so they didn't quite cotton on to the 
relationship between increased numbers of kills and their increased transmission security. Likewise, during a period when Enigma traffic was being read quite easily and the number of U-boats being surprised and killed by Allied aircraft was going up dramatically, once again the Germans became suspicious that their Enigma codes were being read. However, this coincided with the recovery of a crashed Allied bomber that happened to have a cavity magnetron still on board and the remains of a radio direction finding system, which then seemed to confirm to the Germans that in fact these kills had been made by aircraft equipped with radio direction finders. However, whilst the ver number of various Enigma networks, as well as the level of security, the complexity of the dial settings, etc., was being increased steadily throughout the war, the simple fact of the matter was that by about 1942 going into 1943, the Allies had combined the best of the Polish, French, British and American cryptanalysis teams, as well as applying the considerable industrial and financial leverage of both Britain and the US towards producing these mechanical cryptologic bombs, all based, of course, as we said before, on the Polish model. And, of course, with the Enigma machine being an electromechanical device with a finite number of settings, the Allies could simply keep producing more and larger cryptologic bombs, which were, of course, of themselves massively complex machines. And so sooner or later, the sheer number of possible rotor combinations and other settings that the various Allied decoding machines could try in a relatively short space of time would simply exceed the number of possible permutations that an Enigma machine was capable of. And this in turn meant that during the course of the last two to three years of the war, the amount of time required to decode any given transmission dropped dramatically. In mid-1943, a decent Enigma code combination could take two days to decipher, whereas by 1945, it was taking maybe ten minutes on some of the easily solvable ones. And even the most complex late war devices, with multiple settings and different methods of code security, could still be read in a day or two. Of course, using all this information was another matter, but it's estimated by most authors that the simple act of being able to re break and read certain Enigma messages, obviously in increasing frequency as the war went on, shortened the war considerably. Estimates vary between one and three years, and in some cases, especially with some of the earlier messages, possibly even changed the course of large sections and campaigns of the war entirely, especially around the U-boat campaign. So there you have it, a short history of roughly how Enigma was broken, some of the key players in it, and hopefully a bit more of an understanding as to how Enigma worked in the first place, which, as I said previously, serves to underline just what a massive accomplishment this was by the various cryptologists in the Allied cause. And if you particularly enjoy the nice warm feeling of your brain melting out of its ears in a desperate attempt to flee from what you're trying to do to it, I will include a link in the description to a copy of the cryptographic history of the work on the German naval enigma, which was one of a number of sources, but probably the main source that was used in the making of this video. I hope I haven't confused you all too much, and tune back in in a few days for some slightly easier to explain warships. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.